In the early morning hours of September 15, 1944, aboard the troop transport ships in front of Peleliu, one of two small southernmost islands of the Palau's island chain, selected as the objectives of Operation Stalemate II, the battle-hardened veterans of the 1st Marine Division, began final preparation for the upcoming amphibious assault. Unlike their previous campaigns in Guadalcanal and New Britain, this time, Marines of Old Breed, as the division was named, were to storm heavily defended beaches, for the first time. During the briefing, they had been told by their commanding officer, Major General William H. Rupertus, that it was going to be a fight like on Tarawa, rough but fast, mainly because of the devastating quantity and quality of naval gunfire, and air bombing preceding their assault. Many have already heard what happened on Tarawa, and this comparison did not sound very reassuring. However, the first spell of optimism came a day before D-Day, on September 14, when Rear Admiral Jesse Oldendorf, commander of the Navy's fire support group, declared that he had run out of targets, and sent most of his heavy ships to support MacArthur's invasion of Moratai. This news, and the lack of any Japanese response, probably cheered some Marines, who hoped that this time the Navy had done its job, and that they would not have to do more than mop up the few remaining survivors. Unfortunately, their optimism will be short-lived. As the Marines of the first landing waves, began boarding Amtrak's and landing craft at 5.30 am, a few remaining warships, started with the final pre-landing bombardment of the beaches from close range. At 7.50, when Amtrak's approached the coast, the ships lifted the barrage more inland. Shortly after, carrier-based planes, strafed the beaches in front of the first landing waves, in the final attempt to soften the beach defenses. Preceding the Marines, were armored amphibian tanks armed with turreted 37mm guns, closely followed by Amtraks, equipped with rocket launchers, howitzers, and mortars that fired salvo after salvo of indirect fire onto the island, covering the entire coastline with a thick smoke screen. When the first Amtraks approached a few hundred meters of shore, all of a sudden, the whole island came alive. With artillery and mortar fire, the Japanese announced their presence, dispelling any doubt that there were still plenty of Japanese alive on Peleliu. And although indirect fire against moving targets, caused more confusion than damage, even so, by the end of the first day, the Japanese fire had destroyed 26 Amtraks. At 8.32 am, just two minutes behind schedule, the men of the 3rd Battalion of the 1st Marines, came ashore first, on White Beach 1, and within the next few minutes, the Marines landed on all five landing beaches. The 1st Marines, landed in good order, with the 3rd Battalion on the left, and the 2nd on the right, while the 1st Battalion, was to land approximately one hour later as a regimental reserve. The 2nd Battalion advanced steadily, pushing inland some 320 meters through heavy woods, against Japanese resistance, described in their after-action report as moderate. After reaching the far side of the woods, facing the airfield and buildings area at 9.30 am, they had to stop, because of the problems encountered by the 3rd Battalion, on their left. The 3rd Battalion of the 1st Marines, on the other hand, found themselves in serious trouble as soon as they landed on White 1. Besides heavily emplaced Japanese on the beach, who put out stubborn and violent resistance, when Marines advanced barely 100 meters inland, they found themselves confronted by a most formidable natural obstacle, a long and rugged coral ridge, about 10 meters high. Like many other coral ridges, this one, named by the Marines simply as the point, was also steep, honeycombed with caves that were expanded with explosives by the Japanese, and turned into an excellent defensive position, surrounded by a deep anti-tank trench. This encounter, came as an unpleasant surprise for the Marines, as according to intelligence, the entire island was supposed to be, low and flat. The well-dug-in Japanese, repelled all initial assaults on this formidable strongpoint, and even after the tanks arrived to support the assault troops, they could not approach it, due to the anti-tank ditch. The fight for the point, quickly became one of the fiercest and most confusing fights in the Pacific War, 
that lasted for the next eight hours, and which had produced two substantial gaps in the line, with the most serious one being the corridor between the ridge and the sea, that endangered the left flank and the position of the entire division. And while the reserve 1st Battalion, was committed to fighting as soon as it landed, only to end up pinned down for hours in front of the point, the 1st Marines commander, Colonel Louis Chesty Puller, one of the most experienced officers in the Marine Corps, and the most decorated Marine in American history, formed provisional companies from headquarters personnel and engineer battalion, sending them to close the existing gaps, and prepare the defense against the threat of an upcoming counterattack. In the meantime, since all frontal attacks on the point failed, two platoons from Company K of the 3rd Battalion, under Captain George P. Hunt, positioned on the extreme left flank of the beachhead, began to fight their way inland, attempting to bypass the point from the side. For two hours, neutralizing one Japanese emplacement after another, using hand grenades and bazookas, the Marines moved slowly across heavy terrain, in an epic small unit combat action. After reaching a favorable position at 10.15 am, they stormed the point from the flank, driving off and annihilating the remaining defenders, destroying the final reinforced concrete bunker with a rifle grenade, that caused a massive explosion. Approximately 30 men of the two platoons, who had survived the assault, remained isolated on the point for 30 hours. For the rest of the day and through the night, Hunt and his men held the point as best they could, against the series of sharp Japanese counterattacks which developed, relying heavily on captured Japanese machine guns and rifles, to stave off annihilation. Once relieved the following day, Hunt had only 18 men under his command, and after the first day, out of 235 men of Company K, only 78, were still combat ready. Despite all efforts, by nightfall, the gap on the left flank remained open, leaving the entire bridgehead vulnerable to a counterattack. Fortunately, a new Japanese defensive doctrine, did not anticipate a significant counterattack, aimed at driving the invaders back to sea, and therefore, this particular attack never occurred. The 5th Marines in the center, landed with its two battalions in good order, on Orange 1 and 2 Beach, encountering only scattered resistance on the beaches, and not much more immediately inland. The terrain in their landing zone, was favorable for maneuver, and coconut groves provided ample cover with little obstruction. The 1st Battalion, 5th Marines on the left, moved through without many difficulties, tying in firmly with the 1st Marines on their left. After reaching the open ground in front of the airstrip, the 1st Battalion had to stop, partly because of the inability of the 1st Marines to advance, on the extreme left, and partly to the murderous artillery and mortar fire, from the high ground to the north, which now swept the open airfield to their front. On Orange 2 Beach, the 3rd Battalion ran into more difficulties, just as they came ashore. The unit's executive officer, Major Robert Ash, was killed within a few moments of hitting the beach, when the Amtrak he was in, was hit by artillery, killing almost all of the headquarters personnel and destroying most of the battalion's field telephone equipment. Furthermore, heavy Japanese flanking fire from the right end of the landing sector, caused elements of the 7th Marines, to be landed on the southern zone of Orange 2 Beach, rather than on Orange 3 as planned, causing confusion in the landing zone, and delaying the battalion's advance inland. Once the situation cleared, the 3rd Battalion had to advance through a heavy terrain covered by scrub jungle, and infested by Japanese troops, well hidden in a series of pillboxes and bunkers. Without proper communication and a clear line of sight, as they moved inland, the advancing companies dispersed, losing contact with each other, and leaving gaps in the line open, forcing Colonel Harold Harris, the 5th Marines commander, to commit companies of his reserve 2nd Battalion early in the battle in an effort to reinforce the fragile line. To make matters worse, around 5 p.m., the Japanese mortar shell, fell on the 3rd Battalion Command Post, seriously wounding its commander Lieutenant Colonel Austin Schofner and several other command staff members, which disrupted the effectiveness of the 3rd Battalion as a unit. Executive Officer of the 5th Marines, Lieutenant Colonel Lewis Walt, assumed command of the 3rd Battalion, 
but it took him all night to restore order, and locate battalion companies. Approximately at the same time, when Colonel Schofner was wounded, somewhere around 4.50 p.m., the 5th Marines, came under the only major Japanese counterattack during D-Day, when some 15 Japanese tanks, supported by infantry, stormed across the airfield from the north, striking at the boundary between 1st and 5th Marines. This attack, was not a frenzy, suicidal banzai charge, but a disciplined advance of veteran troops. Unfortunately for the Japanese, this attack came too late in the day, and rather than hitting disorganized first assault waves still on the beach, by the time the Japanese launched a counterattack, the Marines had enough tanks and anti-tank weapons already ashore. And although the attack developed decent at the start, it quickly deteriorated, when the Japanese tanks rushed over the open field, leaving the bulk of the supporting infantry behind. The light Japanese tanks alone, stood no chance, and even where they broke through the marine lines, they quickly became the focus of anti-tank fire of every sort and caliber, which tore them to pieces. Within a few minutes, the marines destroyed all but two tanks that managed to withdraw, and wiped out half of the Japanese infantry. Despite fierce resistance and heavy terrain, the 5th Marines, pushed more inland than any other 1st Marine Division's unit, forming almost all-round defense after reaching their day's objectives. And although they encountered less strong resistance than their comrades on the flanks, their advance did not pass without heavy casualties. Meanwhile, the 7th Marines, under Colonel Herman H. Hanneken, who, just like Chesty Puller, was an experienced officer and veteran of pre-war campaigns in Haiti and Nicaragua, where his actions earned him a Medal of Honor, had to land with its two battalions in a column, on the right flank of the division front, on Beach Orange 3, while the remaining 2nd Battalion, was to remain afloat as a division's reserve. And as the 3rd Battalion neared the coast, closely followed by the 1st, scheduled to land immediately behind, the Amtrak's carrying Marines soon came under heavy flanking machine gun and anti-boat gun fire, from the southern end of Peleliu and from an unnamed island offshore, beyond their right flank, that caused many Amtraks to veer off to the left, ending on Orange 2 instead of Orange 3, creating confusion on the 5th Marines beach, while those who landed on Orange 3, found themselves in an area full of landmines and barbed wire. This confusion, ultimately resulted in precious time being lost on reorganization, before the 7th Marines, began advancing inland. As soon as they pushed a few hundred meters from the beach, they also, just like the 1st Marines on the left flank, ran on a substantial obstacle in front of them, and this time, however, it was not fearsome, instead, it turned out to be very useful. A short distance inland from Orange 3, the Japanese had dug a large anti-tank ditch, that Marines used to move troops forward in relative safety. It also proved to be an ideal dugout for the battalion command post, also providing cover for an advance element of the 1st Marine Division's headquarters group, under Assistant Division Commander, Brigadier General Oliver P. Smith. After crossing the ditch, the 3rd Battalion pushed inland some 500 meters, where at 10.45 a.m., the lead elements were halted by the fierce Japanese resistance, in front of the blockhouse, which had been reported destroyed by pre-landing naval gunfire, and gun emplacements positioned in the ruins, of the Japanese barracks area. The 1st Battalion came ashore at 10.30 am, on Orange 3 as planned, and began to advance inland against light resistance. When they turned right as per plan, Japanese resistance increased. In addition to stiff defense, poor maps, and intelligence received from aerial reconnaissance photos, once more let the marines down. This time, the right flank of the battalion's advance, found themselves facing a dense swamp, not shown on any map. With the only trail around it, heavily defended, it took marines a considerable time to fight their way around the swamp. It was not until 3.20 p.m., that the 1st Battalion finally reached their objective set for the day. Throughout the night, the 7th Marines' perimeter, came under several strong Japanese counter-attacks, that were all beaten off. Again, these were not the usual Banzai charges that Marines expected, 
but more coordinated, well-prepared infantry attacks, aimed at harassing the defenders and inflicting as many casualties on the Americans as possible. As the day wore on, and with the darkness closing, the forward movement, halted along most of the 1st Marine Division's front. The Japanese resistance encountered by the Marines, turned out to be much heavier than anyone anticipated. Plenty of them survived the Navy's pre-invasion bombardment, well hidden in a complex network of tunnels, and other underground installations and fortifications. By the end of the day, the Marines gained only a slim foothold on the island, holding the beachhead approximately 2,700 meters in length, and averaging 450 meters in depth, with one maximum penetration of about 1,300 meters. These gains, were very disappointing, considering the price the 1st Marine Division had to pay to achieve them. The D-Day on Peleliu, brought heavier losses than expected, costing the division a total of 1,111 casualties, of which 210 were killed in action, missing or died of wounds, and 901 were wounded in action, not including combat fatigue and heat prostration cases. To regain the assault momentum, for the following day, General Rupertus, began committing his reserve, ordering the Division Reconnaissance Company to land on Orange 3, to reinforce the 7th Marines, and shortly after he ordered the same to the last Division's reserve, the 2nd Battalion of the 7th Marines. With all of its troops ashore, the 1st Marine Division prepared for the next day. A few civilians, who chose to share the fate of the Marines on shore on Peleliu, witnessed the horrors of the battle, and among them was Time Correspondent Robert Martin, who furnished the following description of what it was like there, concluding that, Peleliu is a horrible place, incomparably worse than Guam in its bloodiness, terror, climate and the incomprehensible tenacity of the Japs. For sheer brutality and fatigue, I think it surpasses, anything, yet seen in the Pacific.